Thank you for joining us for the third lecture in the 2022 Legends of Simpson lecture series. I am very excited to have our guest, Dr. Ev Lanning, with us today as he presents Campus Tales Untold, another take on the Whispering Maple's reputation. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ev Lanning. Well, hi there from an inner sanctum here at Simpson College. Man, if they changed this campus since I was a faculty member of it. Uh, when I was a Rotarian and was the third person from Simpson to become a district governor of Rotary International, I was called an icon. Now I have to figure out what being a legend is all about, but I got some interesting uh, insight today when at seven o'clock my wake up alarm rang on this instrument of being invented by demons. And as soon as I put the drop in my eye that followed it, it off, it went again. And it tells me I've got an email, but my phone can't deliver it to me because I don't have the app for it. Well, I found out when I got to my computer and uh, took a good hard look at it at something like uh, 1 23 a.m today my computer received an email from someone wanting to let me know that they were going to be watching this right now and it had gotten lost in cyberspace somewhere for 11 hours. It, it was yesterday she sent that message. Now, what's wrong with this situation? We're beginning with. Uh, I'm here with my ID at Simpson, my cherished Simpson College Faculty Emeritus card. It gets you into places sometimes. <laughs> and The manuscript that I want to share. Well, I'm not going to read them to you. What I'm going to do is do something that a Simpson legend in my life, my father in law, George D. Wilson, uh, provided when he, as we were discussing what campus life at Simpson amounted to when he and Lucille were there in the 20s and graduated in the class of 25 and what Ruth and I experienced as members of the class of 1953. Interestingly enough, Dad shared that one of the most abiding, striking differences between their time as Simpson students and Ruth and mine was that any dancing, holding one another close to you in your arms was forbidden. Now, let me tell you what uh, Joe Walt's research for this little tome turned up. You know, all the historical records of Simpson College that uh, would be useful to a history of a, an institution. Prior to 1923, I think it was, were lost by a fire in the Simpson building that contained them. Attempts to provide a history in written form had been attempted by several beloved, uh, what we now call Simpson legends. And they were at a loss for what in the world can I say? Because all of our beginning just wasn't there. The people that had them in their memories were gone. They couldn't be tapped. Now, um, we had a legend prior to his retirement 
Joe Wall had become well known for making history interesting and fun and uh, enjoyable. But he, knowing the challenge that it would confront him if he tried to write a history without material to cite that was reliable, it wasn't going to amount to much. Well, uh, what made it possible for him was, as he approached retirement, he had a thought. A lot of newspapers were published in Indianola from early on in its history. Might there be anything there that would be useful? Now, what he did was find that the Iowa Historical Society had recorded in microfilm all of the print copies of things that they ever got their hands on. And there's some interesting stuff in what they got their hands on. So, what they find is those papers had made verbatim copies of items to share with their readers. And bingo, there's the stuff which fills the whispering maples with stuff you're, you can be happy. <laughs> Isn't remembered by everyone on everything. But what I discovered later in life after Ruth and I had been a married couple was that uh, Dad Wilson and uh, the Hillman president's son, who was a classmate, had a reputation for organizing those scandalous kind of dances. And the conservative Christians of the day were livid in their detraction of anyone who would do such a diabolical thing. So, Joe Walt had delight in going through what he found in those old newspapers and the ones that uh, describe <laughs> uh, students who were upset with some of the decisions made and the requirements placed upon them by Simpson faculty and administrators or whatever deserve their finding overripe fruits and vegetables to hurl with very accuracy at those offending persons who stood on a platform and told them what they had to do or not to do. <clears throat> so, this Simpson legend teller is left with a quandary for dad and President Hillman's son to have been the ones who secretly admitted co-eds and took them to the attic of the presidential residence to do those hugging dances. Oh my goodness, that would be. Well, in spite of all of the stuff that Joe reported, He found nothing to confirm. If those incidents were worthy of journalistic coverage, they didn't appear. So I was left 
with having to come up with something else to think about. And here's what I've done. Um, Simpson has been fortunate over much of its history to find persons to give classroom instruction who treated it not as a day job uh, with a sufficient salary or really often an insufficient salary to support the lifestyle to which they aspired. What they really were, some of them, were persons who saw their opportunity to share their knowledge with young adults who had limited contact, limited exposure to the sorts of things that were in the curriculum of what we call higher education. Benefited from mentoring. Now, mentoring meant that they took a personal interest in who they were, knew them by name, invited them into their homes, always looked to what is going on in their life. How's it going? What can we do to help? And those mentors created in my father-in-law's era. And knowledge of an ethical thinking about business, money making business. He was here for about eight to 10 years and in Ohio University spirited him away where he taught principles of business and uh, business ethics and so on until his retirement. And he started a round robin letter to all of his Simpson graduates. And they persisted in that activity, relying on it to connect again with the meaningful relationships that they found among classmates where they rose above protracted adolescence and assumed meaningful, needed, useful, credible, honest businesses. Records indicate that uh, for the time that Hecker, Professor Hecker was their mentor. It gave them the vision, the purpose to do a, a top-notch job in the, in the business world and were among the first of Simpson's cherished alumni to have net worth of seven figure numbers. What Simpson has done is created a desire for knowledge that isn't completed in any limited number of years in whatever learning setting we enter. It's people who develop a lifetime thirst to know the best possible methods of achieving things, of honoring and respecting things. And they passed it on to students. In the uh, War on Poverty era of the 20th century here at Simpson, uh, 
I had some direct involvement. It was an attempt to reach out to people who had been systematically uh, held back, discriminated against, not made welcome in places where they could acquire and develop skills that were marketable and ethical, that what had become so endemic in American life to disvalue people who spoke with accents, whose complexion was of a different shade than those who enjoyed success, prominence, and power, and hence were held back. Simpson was criticized for trying to have a part to play in the war on poverty by accepting students who on uh, GP tests uh, didn't have the grade point or apparently the skills to benefit from a higher education. And so we're not really being sought as enrollment candidates. For a more careful reading of the essay portions of those applications, so often rejected, was clear indication of what these men and women had done with their lives up to that point, using every available opportunity that came before them, their sense of purpose, justice, and how to be a partner in it was 100% reflected in the successful entrance of people with higher GPAs. So what'd we do? We decided to ask these people to come in person so that we could interview them and learn something face to face about their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations. And in that we saw the ability to function at Simpson's level of expectations and would not jeopardize Simpson's standing in the boards that calculated our quality of education. Not all of those who accepted Simpson's offer stayed with it because racism was rampant in our culture. At Simpson, they saw a lot of white complexion and very little of people with the color of theirs. And it wasn't clear that opportunity had been granted here to persons of color and cultural difference and foreign accents who had left here with opportunity before them that they were able to achieve by doing what was often seen as twice as much as those of us who could call on people to put in a good word for us. If we found ways to give
mentoring that help them acquire at a rapid pace a sense of being wanted with skills that they could be happily uh, congratulated for having. And in this, we began to make a difference that included people who had been bypassed by the predominant society of primarily uh, European origin to become productive, thrilling, engaging, gifted, whole members of Simpson's alumni. Keeping in touch with cultivated friends here and shared visions and assistance to one another and the formal provision of help for any student having trouble in a subject matter to find someone who could, who had mastered that problem they were having in that subject to help them find a solution. Out of that has come at Simpson a vision of helping all students in need of special attention, not because they're dumb, but because they, their upbringing has not been as rich in content as it needed to be for friends, family to advise legitimately or, or, you know, accurately what's going on in study could do for you. We now have a depart or have had, I have to put it that way, a very important department intended for any student at Simpson to receive the help they need to learn how to study, to interact with other people, to find their passion and zeal and cultivate it to a high level of motivation. We were not 100% successful, but let me give you an, another illustration here. Among Simpson legends is one Fred Jones. Fred Jones was an athlete. His goal was to be a lawyer. Because of an athletic injury, he was unable to attend regularly one of my classes. He asked if uh, he could complete it by a summer means and submit it for evaluation. I agreed to that. 
made sense. When I read it, it was hasty, uninspired. Hardly worth the paper on which it appeared. I shared my disappointment with Fred and said, try it again. Let me see what you can really do. I did. He did. He became one of Simpson's cherished legends. Continuing in the classroom beyond the years that I completed here. What Simpson has to offer is an appreciation for helping people not get stuck in a rut of the same old thing over and over again. And another illustration is from, for a Simpson faculty member who arrived here and I guess was to teach a course in religion and he'd been to seminary and had a degree in theology, but did not see pastoral ministry as his vocation. Teaching seemed to be more identified with his strength. Now that man was not given a contract, a continuing contract, when it was learned that he would not seek ordination in order to be, to remain on the faculty. My college roommate and I, raised in cultural Christian, context as we were, went to him one day and laid out our disappointment with these Christians who are do nothing, who don't know what they're doing, who don't know the Bible and don't do this, don't do that. And it, the man said, well, what's, what's your problem with that? Well, they don't get it. Get what? What we think should be done. We want consistency with the orthodoxy that we have learned from others, not here. And I still see Harry Beardsley stroking his chin and running his finger over his mouth and saying, consistency is the bane of little minds. What good is learning new things to you if you don't utilize them? We have experienced the use of what I call human capital. Looking at the people we're working with primarily as faculty and administrators, uh, people coming in young adulthood, uh, not clear in terms of their hopes, their dreams, their way life is living and they would prefer to live. And we have had people listen to us. And we listen to them. 
and what I've learned from my students. Helping them solve their problems have certainly solved problems that I have had. Caring and sharing in a community of trust is a hallmark for Simpson. The last presidential <laughs> uh, session as a supporter led by uh, our current Simpson president described how students now, a quarter century since I was in the classroom as an instructor and half a century from when I was a student or more, teamwork is what's emphasized. Making change without a sense of why and how to accomplish it is just an invitation to frustration. So study teams can be organized or urged to call students. Find other people in your course work that are willing to study together and help one another master what our understanding is sticking and needs a little lubing. Caring for one another, sharing with one another. Simple research has shown that Simpson prospers from the close lifetime friendships that had their birth and early growth. In a place under a canopy of whispering maples. May we be contributors to an ongoing legacy of investing in that human capital and seeing it grow and cheering its accomplishments. What do you want to know that I haven't told you? <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Lanning. And I know that a lot of those participating today are very, very thankful that they can call you a friend because of how you touch their lives as a professor uh, here at, at Simpson. Now, I do ask that if anybody has any questions, feel free to submit those through the Q&A uh, and we will, I will present those to Dr. Lanning. Don't be shy. You know, if you don't talk, I will. If you ask questions, I'll try to answer. It's not a question, but a comment that brought tears to my eyes. Thank you for sharing it. Well, there's tears of joy that flow liberally in Simpson circles that I have made and laughing is much more pleasant than pill popping. Here's a question that's come in. Who was your mentor or biggest influence at Simpson? Hey, there it goes. You're asking me or you're gonna tell me? Let not you tell me who your mentor is. And if not, let's see if we can't find one for you. Well, who was yours, Dr. Lanning? Oh, he came as a former truck driver from Indiana. 
Now, uh, that man had more recognition of and appreciation for human possibilities than anyone else in my life up to that point. He would take a student, he, he, he had a, a classy New Hudson automobile that was just a, if you, if you loved cars, you, you salivated at the thought. He would find a struggling student and uh, say, hey, let's go for a ride. And what for? I want to show you some things around here. And in that time, he would have a conversation that led him to understand where the problem was for this young man or woman. And he worked diligently to find a mentor to help him out of it. When he learned that as a student pastor, a history professor of mine at Simpson who, seeing little evidence of intellectual capability in most of these preacher boys, gave me a D at midterm. I went to him and said, what's up? What's up? You never prepare. Would you call on me on a Wednesday or Friday when I've had the chance to read ahead? I would be leaving com campus on a Friday or Saturday and not appear back on it till past or approaching midnight on Sunday. And admittedly, any class that gave me instruction on Friday or Saturday was hardly dealt with at all until after my eight o'clock class on Monday was behind me. And he refused to call on me, miscreant that I was, almost ever, let alone on a Monday. Now, Don Kuntz heard about this and realized that this person was a fly in the ointment of more than one preacher boy. So he did a strange thing. Don went to him said, you know, I'm having trouble with preacher boys. I, I can't keep them. I, I, I struggle to find places for these young men to go in ministry. And what would you think? Do you have a message you could bring to these churches I, I can't get these students in line for? It was a life-changing experience for that instructor. The end story is he left Simpson to attend seminary and last known was president of a denominational college elsewhere. His was a transformative mentoring, taking people where they were finding out where they wanted to go and helping them achieve their hopes and dreams. Thank you for that, Ev. I have some comments that are coming in that I just want to share with everyone. And then I uh, have a couple more questions too. Thanks for sharing your very informative insights, Dr. Lanning. You and Dr. Jones and others made a tr tremendous impact on me. 
Not right. really a question, but I was just at the theater 1970s reunion this past weekend, and I wanted to say hi, Friar Lawrence, with love from Juliet. Good enough. I had the privilege of working with and being a student of both you and Dr. Jones. Thank you for everything you both did for me at Simpson. And then I have a comment and a question, and that is, I wholeheartedly agree the mentoring between faculty and students was one of the most valuable things I learned at Simpson. And the question is, I also appreciated the emphasis on liberal arts education. Can you speak more to that? Well, liberal arts needs to be truly liberal. That is to say, uh, introducing uh, students wanting higher education to discover things that had never crossed their path, uh, aspirations for things that uh, no one in their circle uh, had ever seen or mentioned to them. Now, the liberality means curiosity finding out what's going on. When I started as a uh, formal classroom teacher in sociology, um, something like uh, no more than about uh, two pages of double column job categories were available to census takers. By the time I left, it amounted to over six pages of densely spaced categories of how to have a, earn a living. So our, part of our role in the liberal arts is to not simply teach to our preferences, but to help people discover opportunities that up till then had not ever even been mentioned to them. And then help them find resources to pursue it if that's what they want. Finding out what people have done is one of the increasingly great joys that I have to live so long and meet again. Men and women who entrusted Their, their, <laughs> their hidden person. And I did not sit in judgment on them. I saw how to help. And this will be the final question and it's actually posed by a, a fellow Simpson legend. It says, Ev, you suggested that interactions with students where they are and who they are is at the core of a Simpson education. How can, how can we continue that tradition in such a challenging world our students currently come out of, namely this pandemic? Namely taking every opportunity to exercise it that comes to us. And some of them we have to go to uh, and help people who sit in judgment uh, that is negative and act in ways that are counterproductive to uh, consider other, other ways of treating life and thinking people are worthless on whatever count is erroneous to the core. We are a most uh, adaptive and diverse and successful species of creation in God's good green earth. All right. Well, with that, I'd like to say thank you, Dr. Laning, for being here with us today. And we're proud to call you a Simpson legend. And thank you all uh, for being here and, and listening to a, a true legend of Simpson College today. So thank you all and have a wonderful day.